Hi, this is Mrs. Jones, and today we want to take a look at the relationship between energy and molecules within ecosystems. How do they move? How do they get from one organism to another? Where does an organism get the energy that it needs to function? If we take a look at this pretty picture of a temperate deciduous forest. That's the biome that covers the eastern United States and most of Europe. Uh, we see the sun streaming through the trees and hitting the leaves and those leaves are capturing that sunlight and doing photosynthesis. So what happens after that? How do the other organisms that we can't see here, the birds and the squirrels and the fungi and, and the bacteria in the soil, how do they all get the energy that they need? This is a really important concept. It's part of two of the four big ideas in the AP Bio curriculum. So you'll see this again and again and again. Uh, we'll look at it at all different levels. Right now we're looking at the ecosystem level. It will come up again at the cellular level and the molecular level. Um, but it does start with these concepts of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, two very important processes. We need to remember the formula for those processes. Um, so photosynthesis, so the carbon dioxide, which is coming from the air, the water, which is coming from the ground, both being brought into the plant. Sunlight is shining on the leaves. The leaves have chloroplasts full of chlorophyll. So they do photosynthesis and convert that carbon dioxide and water into glucose, C6H12O6, which is the building block for all other carbohydrates. And oxygen is a waste product and it's just released to the air. Cellular respiration basically undoes this process. Plants do cellular respiration as well as animals doing cellular respiration. And both plants and animals then take the glucose that's been made by the plant. And with the use of oxygen, so now our reactants are becoming our products, and this is happening in the mitochondria. We've got ADPs and phosphates within that mitochondria, and they are going to be converted to ATP and we'll have waste products of carbon dioxide, which is going back into the air, which is where the plants got it, and water, which will go into the air and ultimately uh, become part of the water cycle, may end up back in groundwater. Uh, but we've charged up these ADPs, added on the phosphate, and now have ATPs that use to power all the cell activities of that plant or animal or whatever organism those mitochondria are in. So a, a question to think about is which of these molecules are organic molecules? That means they have a carbon-hydrogen bond. And which ones are inorganic? Well, I've kind of giving you a cue with the color of the post-it notes here. The only organic molecules here are the glucose. So what you can see has happened is the plants have taken carbon dioxide, inorganic carbon dioxide from the air, inorganic water from, from the ground, and light, uh, sunlight, and made an organic compound, this glucose. That energy from the sun is being stored in that glucose, and then cellular respiration takes that energy and converts it to yet a different form that can be used by the cells. So we can kind of say we're taking water and air and light and making food and making plants out of it. So ecosystems are the transformers of energy, they're the processors of matter, and they're self-sustaining. So they're, they're transforming this energy from light to chemical energy, they're processing the matter, the carbon and the hydrogen and the oxygen that we're finding in those molecules, but they do this um, in a self-sustaining way. So what do they need to be able to do that? Well, they're, they're capturing that energy, they're transferring the energy then from one organism to the next, and they're cycling the nutrients. And we're gonna take a bit of a look at those three things. So you may remember the idea of a food chain or a food web. So we've got a very simple food chain here. 
Um, the sun is providing energy to the grass, which is our producer. The grasshopper here is consuming that grass, so the arrow is going from the grass to the grasshopper because the energy is going from the grass into the grasshopper. Um, the grasshopper is our primary consumer or herbivore. Then say in this ecosystem we have a shrew, which is a, a insect, a little insect eating animal. Um, this is our secondary consumer. The shrew's eating the grasshopper. The grasshopper ate the grass, so it's secondary. These are often omnivores or might just be a, a carnivore. And then we've got a third level or tertiary consumer in this food chain. I've got a fox that's gonna eat the shrew that ate the grasshopper that ate the grass, right? So we've got the energy that came from the sun moving from one organism to the next. But Ecosystems aren't this simple. Take these little nuts off. We're gonna have other organisms, not just these four. So let's say we also have a mouse. Maybe the mouse eats grass or the seeds from the grass. So we've got energy going into the mouse from the grass. Mice would eat, mice eat insects as well. So the mighty uh, grasshopper, we've got energy going from the grasshopper to the mouse. And let's say we also have a hawk. Well, the hawk's gonna eat the mouse. The hawk's gonna eat the shrew. I think a fox is a little too big for a hawk. But see, we've got these more involved interrelationships and the way the energy is moving. So where does the energy go? And is anything gonna eat the hawk and get the energy? How many how many levels can we get? I only I stopped at the tertiary consumer, which would be our fox or our hawk. Why is there not something that eats the fox or the hawk? To answer that question. We're going to look at an ecological pyramid, in this case an energy pyramid. These are sometimes also called tropic pyramids. So we've got the sun again providing energy. We've got our producers, primary consumers, secondary, tertiary consumers again, uh, just arranged in a different way here in this pyramid. So let's measure this energy. So let's say a million joules of energy, and a joule is a, a measurement of energy like a calorie is. Um, so if we've got a million joules of energy from the sun, about 1% of that energy gets captured by the plants, by the producers in, in the ecosystem. So that gives us 10,000 joules at the producer level. And the number to remember is 10%, and we'll look at where that comes from in just a moment, but 10% of that energy gets passed to the organisms that consume it. So this was our grass, primary, that's our grasshopper. Um, so only 10% of the sun's energy that the producers captured is available to the grasshoppers. So that gives us a thousand joules available to the grasshoppers. If we lose another 90%, only 10% that can be passed up to our, um, this was our shrew or our mouse up here. Um, only a hundred joules of that original million that was available from the sun is actually in that level containing the mouse or the shrew. Uh, and in the, the top level um, was our hawk or our fox. Um, again, now we're down to only 10 joules of energy that are available it, to that uh, organism. So what does that mean? Where does, where does this energy go? If we just take a look here at our, at our primary consumer, about 40% of the energy that that consumer eats, so 40% of the calories, 40% of the joules, get used to run cellular respiration to make ATP. Um, then that ATP gets used for movement, for cell division, muscle contraction. Um, so that 40% of the calories or joules consumed by that organism get used up by cellular respiration and, and uh, the cellular activities that are powered by it. About 50% is waste, some of that's heat, some of that's lost in um, bodily, body waste. And then about 10% of it gets actually used for growth. So when we're talking about growth, what do we mean that actually is 
the molecules that are going to get built into the body of that organism. So it's only those molecules that get built into the body of that organism that are available for the next level to consume, right? The hawk is going to, or the shrew is going to eat the grasshopper, so it can't get any of the energy that the uh, were the costs of living of that grasshopper that the grasshopper used up by hopping around and uh, finding a mate and finding its own food and 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 eliminating its waste. Um, the only energy available to that shrew is the 10% of the energy uh, that the grasshopper consumed that it actually built into its body. Okay. So that's what's happening to that energy and that's where that 10% number comes comes from. So that gets us to this important concept of primary productivity of an ecosystem. So here's the definition of primary productivity. It's the amount of sunlight that's actually converted to chemical energy. So the amount of sunlight that gets captured and converted to chemical energy by the producers during a particular time period. So in the previous example, we had about 1% um, that can vary, but that's the measure of primary productivity. So is that all of the chemical energy that's stored as organic material? Well, no, that's what we just saw before. So when we're doing the lab we're going to be doing on primary productivity, you're going to be ultimately calculating the net primary productivity, or NPP, which is the um, gross primary productivity. That's all the sunlight energy that's being captured minus what the producers themselves are using in cellular respiration. So don't forget that plants do cellular respiration. I'll say that again, don't forget that plants do cellular respiration. They have to convert that glucose uh, energy, the energy from the glucose into ATPs to power their own cell activities. So they use some of the energy they capture from the sun, they use that for their own uh, costs of living and the uh, net primary productivity then is what's left and that's what's then available for the next level and part of that available for the next level so the entire ecosystem is built on the shoulders of the producers and how much um, net primary productivity they can achieve i'm going to leave you with the question of what factors might affect that net pro primary productivity how efficient or how adequate might those producers be in supplying enough energy to that ecosystem and how does that affect how many levels you can have, how big the ecosystem might be, um, are ecosystems all over the world equal in their ability to um, have the same net primary productivity or is that going to differ? And your lab is going to be examining some of those um, particularly the amount of light and how the amount of light will affect primary productivity and um, give you some ways to calculate it. So I hope that helps you out and uh, I'll see you in class.